Hello and welcome back to the studio here in Northumberland. Today it's going to be a watercolour painting and again I'm going to be working from my last watercolour book that came out in about October of last year I think it was and it's ready to paint in 30 minutes bolts and harbours. Got to be said it might take a bit longer than 30 minutes to do this one because I'm going to spin it out a little bit and put every detail in for you. Um, and what I'm going to do is on page 51 and this is quite a nice sort of painting, that one, but not too complex and not too difficult. Quite a few boats, but they're all mostly side on, so they're very easy to paint. This book is really useful because it's got loads of painting in it to start with, loads and loads. But in the front bits, there's some tracings in it, and you can either actually pull them out and use the tracing as a tracing, or you can just use the tracing to look at to do your own drawing from. Very, very useful li li little bit of the book that. Got to be said, wasn't my idea, it was the publisher's idea, but it's a really good one. So now to the drawing. I might actually need my reading glasses. Talk amongst yourselves. Here we go. Sign of age, I'm afraid. I'm going to start off with the bolts. The one in the middle first, this one. And they're not particularly complex, these, because most of them are a side view. One there. Notice I'm not finishing the whole thing off at the end here. There's a reason for that. I'll think of it in a minute. <laughs> Front bit there, coming down. And on top of there, I've got a little cabin. An angle to it there, like so. The top bit, treat a boat like a building with the same kind of like angles as a building, especially for the cabin on the top. Look at that, that's coming down there, and a couple of windows. The pencil I'm using, again, IKEA, no fancy pencils here. A couple of windows. When you're drawing things like windows, you don't need all the detail. You don't need sash windows and window catches. And on top of that, this is nautical terminology. A few bolty bits, squiggly bits, and a little mast. Sorry. Sorry for you southerners. A little mast coming down there. I don't know if you can hear them in the background, but my dogs have decided to bark at someone. A few little bits coming out here, and just a few lumps and lumps and little bits. Now, the back end of the boat now. Come down there, down there, and edge it there. I'm just going to draw in the lines where I'm going to have different colours. Above that line it's going to be white. Below it it's going to be red. A few more bits and pieces there. We'll do first bolt done. One behind it is just a little bit of bolt. The top of that is slightly lower than the top of that. Come down there. And a little bit of its cabin. A couple of windows in that. And a few bits and pieces on top of that as well. Slightly shorter mast on that. We've got a little boat, just a bit there, and a bit there. A little boat behind that. That's more of a rowing boat, really. A 
you lost the basic guy you've got slightly, the base which bolt. This one's on its side. And consequently, consequently, big words, the cabin is leaning over as well. And so are the windows. base of that one actually. We've got a little bolt on its side slightly. So that back the back end line of the bolt is coming down diagonally slightly. And a little bit underneath there. And a bit of the inside of the bolt. And then the final bolt here. Coming out. In the picture it goes out the edge of the painting there. I'm going to end it there. And on top of there, a few bits and pieces. Rollux! I beg your pardon. That's the bit that they always fit in. A couple of oars sticking out the back of the boat. Kind of like inside the bolt. That's all the bolts done. Got a boy there. Rope coming down to that. Well, but have a few more ropes, but I'll just paint those in. Now I've got the C here. I'm going to lower that C to what it is in this one. But you notice the C is above the end of that oar. Don't have a joining line where that bit joins that. Because the eye will just go straight to it. Now in the back here, comes up a little bit of a... And that's the drawing done. How easy is that? The rest will be made up when I put the paint on. What will give the thing all of its shape is the shadow that I put in afterwards. Put the base of that one there. Of course, those bolts are mainly on the side, so they're fairly easy. But the, the shape of a bolt that's slightly coming towards you at an angle slightly, it's a really difficult and worrying shape to a lot of people. An easy way of doing that. You know the old Christian sign that you see on the back of cars? The fish. Watch. Come on in, cameraman, and have a look at this. That Christian symbol that you see on the back of cars, the fish. Once you've got your fish, stick on there. A little bit there. And a little bit there. Got a boat. How easy is that? Now, time for the paint. I'm going to start off with the sky. And as I always tell you, always keep your palette clean. <laughs> I actually had, I get loads of feedback on all the YouTube videos that we put on. Um, and somebody said, how do you manage to keep the colours so clean? And why do you keep your palettes so dirty? I don't know, to both. <laughs> 
So, loads of water first from the top. Don't worry about the bolts, go through them a bit. It would be very time consuming to start and put the water on and then you paint like that carefully around each mast. Sorry, mast. And that would mean that the sky is drying while you're doing it. And that's when you get the chance of cauliflowers. So I'll just go through everything. You can always take out afterwards. I've got a little bit of ultramarine blue here. It's a very simple sky, this one, because I've got quite a lot of stuff going on in front of the sky. So I don't want to complicate it by making a fancy sky. A bit of ultramarine blue, and it's from side to side, big strokes. Always remember, it's going to dry probably 30% lighter than when you put it on. So, allow for that. Wash out, squeeze out. I'm just going to mop up there. Look. Clouds, very, very simple clouds. Oh, a couple of them. If I want a cloud shadow, as I'm taking out there, drop a bit back in there. See? And again, wash out, squeeze out, pop it up. And again, mop up, sky done. How easy is that? Now, my sky's good and dry, and you can see how much lighter it's dried than when I actually put the paint on. So it's always gonna dry that much lighter, so I'll always allow for that. I'm gonna go into this bit of headland here, or sand dune, and then I'm gonna get the sea done. I'm gonna get all the background done before I actually start with the boats. And I've changed to my three quarter inch flat for this. For those of you that don't know, I only ever use four brushes. One and a half inch flat, which I've just used for the sky. Three quarter inch flat, which I shall do all these background bits with now. And I've also got a number eight round and a number four rigger. Those are all the brushes I use. And these are about two, two and a half years old now. They get abused every day of their lives and they're still in good shape and good form. Look, nice round. And that one I split and make a real mess out of it sometimes. But it always goes back to shape. So four brushes, nine colours, and that's all I use all the time in my very mucky palette. So, three quarter inch flat, and I've got a little bit of sand. This is called Charles Evans Sand, a really useful colour, as you'll see. I'm popping that on first. It's a good layering colour. Put other colours on top of the sand and leave the sand showing through here. A little bit there, and then sharpen it towards the bottom there. Round my cabin. When you've got a flat brush, it's really easy to go around structures. A bit there. Now, a little bit of hooker's green and yellow ochre. Like I always say, never ever use hooker's green by itself. Always mix it with something. By itself, it's a totally unnatural colour. As a mixer, it's fabulous. That's hooker's green and yellow ochre. Like so, coming down. Everything that I use is Dale Rowney. The brushes, the paper, the paints, everything. That's all I ever use, Dale Rowney equipment. Dale Rowney have been around since the 1700s. Turner used to use Dale Rowney paint. As did a lot of the other great masters. Of course, of course, in the old days it was just Rowney, not Dale Rowney. Now, a little bit of yellow ochre. Plenty of water into this. I'm just going to pop a little bit on there, look. Leaving a bit of the sand colour showing through. Again, around my cabin. Now, clean damp brush. I'm just going to soften that in a little bit. There. Now, I want some shadow underneath where that grass goes onto the sand. Sand dew. But I just need that to dry for a couple of seconds first. So in the meantime, to the sea. Still with my three-quarter inch flat brush. 
ultramarine blue because that's the blue of my sky. Touch of Hooker's Green. And a tiny touch of Burnt Sienna. Now plenty of water into that. And again, all I'm going to do is just go on there. Straight line on the top. And come down around the boat. Don't worry about those oars. I'll show you a little trick in a minute. But around the boat, because that's easy enough to miss. Now, as I come further forward, I'm going to put a little bit more water into my brush. No more paint, just more water. And soften that down. Now move it around a little bit. And again, wash out, squeeze out, and soften. Leaving some of the darker colour in between, and some lighter bits that I'm taking out. I'm not going into detail with it, I'm just getting different depths of colour on it. Those oars look. I don't actually want those white, and I can see where they are, so I could still paint them on top. But, if I want a light on there, wash my brush out, squeeze out, and just take out. And again, wash out, squeeze out, and take out. I'm going to do the same with the masks as well afterwards. Now, back to that little headland. I've got, again, ultramarine blue. This time, a tiny touch of alizarin crimson. And a tiny touch of burnt sienna. So I've got like a dark aubergine colour there. A bit of water into that. And where the grass, sorry, where the grass comes down to the sand. Dark. Just there. Just there. Got a couple of bits in there as well. Now, looks a mess. Wash out my brush, squeeze out, and soften that colour down. Okay. Soften it in. Now, can you see how that shadow makes those grasses sit down onto the sand? Again, soften. But I've still got my shadow colour. Sorry, I've still got my sand shining through. Nice. Do we want some rocks on the base of that? I think we probably do. So let's have a little bit of yellow ochre. Bit there. And a little bit of raw umber. Raw umber is the only brown I carry in watercolours. And the acrylics actually. So if I take my raw umber by itself, I've got a nice standalone brown. Put a touch of, of blue into the raw umber. I've got sepia. Put a touch of burnt sienna into my sepia mix and I've got Van Dyke Brown. Take my raw umber and burnt sienna together and I've got burnt umber. So I've got four different browns from one tube. This is black, but I'm making the black. Don't use manufactured black, it's horrible. Ultimate blue and burnt sienna will give me a black. A few little blobby bits in there. Blobby bits, that's a technical term. Now, with a card, any old credit card or hotel room cards. I use lots of hotel room cards. Just scrape it up there. Got a few little rocks at the base of that cliff. Wash out. Scoop it out. And just soften that at the base of it. changed my round brush now, number eight round. And you know what I always say about 
never mix your blues, never change your blues for anything you're painting. For anything natural, that is, like grasses, blue in the grass, blue in the water. Got a bit the same blue as this guy. For anything natural, but anything man-made, you can put as many blues as you like in. I'm going to use cobalt blue for that boat further away. Bit of cobalt blue with my round brush. Look, it's very simple. You've only got bits of boats here. Cobalt blue with loads of water. Sorry, with not much water. <laughs> the opposite. And there. And fill that bit in. Now, I'll leave that to dry for a bit. While I go to the boat in front of it. Just cobalt blue. Now I'm just keep looking down here for the simple reason that I'm looking at the photograph of the painting that I'm working from. I've got a little bit of just raw umber for the next boat, and this is a very simple little boat. But it's just raw umber there. I've left the tiniest little sliver of white paper between the two. And as I said, what's going to make these boats and indeed make the painting? Is the shadow that I put in afterwards, towards the end. Fill in that in there. Now, anything white, that's white, in shadow, have a blue tint to it. But for that, I need to go back to my ultramarine blue. It's not cobalt blue. A bit of blue there with plenty of water. I'm just filling in cabin on that one and I'm leaving that side white. Actually while I'm in with that I may as well fill the other cabins in. Just a bit of blue there. And a little bit on that one as well. Now back to that bit of bolt there. And that is ultramarine blue with a touch of burnt sienna into it. Bit of a navy blue. Ha <laughs> ha! Navy! Boats! See where I'm coming from there? See what I did? Look, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna mixed into it. Leaving the top bit white, of course. Filling in there. And come down almost to the bottom, but I've got a strip of red at the bottom of that I think it is. Is it? Yes it is. You know that kind of like ready bit at the bottom of the boat? I think it's called anti-fouling. Don't use red for it, use light red. It's different to a traditional red. There. A bit of light red there and I've left a little strip of white in between the two. Because it is white in between the two but also it's very handy because it stops one colour bleeding into the other. This big boat here is red and I shall use alizarin crimson for that. Alizarin crimson or crimson, both the same. That's nice. Leaving the top bit white. Just being careful that I leave the tiniest little bit of white paper there. Can you see how little that bit is there? But it just stops bleeding in. Around there. And again, I'm not painting down to the bottom. I'm going to leave that white. Around that one. And to the back end. The water, of course, is well and truly dried now, so it doesn't matter if I go into that slightly. Not that I did. Now, this one here, and that is right, but I'm going to be in shadow there. So, I'm just going to pop a 
little bit of blue there. Across a little bit. And now wash my brush out just with a clean damp brush. Pick up some red. <laughs> just with a clean damp brush. Soften that back up. There. Now the top part of that boat is cobalt blue. carefully with the tip of my round brush. Take that around there. And on the back bit. A little bit there. I've got I think that's a like a bench, a seat in there. Got a little bit of the back there as well. Again, shadow will give this the shape that it's needed. Ready to go. Now, that's that boat done. The big one in the foreground here is burnt umber. So, I've got raw umber. And burnt in a mix. There we go, burnt umber. So easy. Number eight round is an ideal size, I think. It's not too small, but also it's not too big. And if you want some fine point work, look, you can get some really fine lines with that look if you want. But press it on further and you get a bigger coverage. Beautiful size. And these aquafine brushes really do keep their shape. And they hold a heck of a lot of water. People always talk about sable brushes being the best for holding water. These will hold so, so more, much water. The difference is the equivalent size in a sable brush is probably about 25 quid. That's £2.50. <laughs> I'm a tight fisted Yorkshire. And underneath that, I've got green odd. Must have been what it was because I painted that on location. Now, hook me blue, sorry, hook us green and burnt sienna. Nice and dark. Don't want too bright a green on that. Bit of water into that. What I'm doing, again, leave a tiny strip of white between the two. Put the green in there. Notice a bit of a bumpy bottom. <laughs> I'm not bothered about having a bumpy bottom because it's going to be sitting on the sand. So you don't need a perfect straight line. Don't worry about it. So if you've got a bumpy bottom, don't fear. Live with it. God, I talk some rubbish. Move back there. There. Now, I'm just going to let some of that dry a bit before I start going into detail on all of the boats. It's time for details in these boats now. I'm going to start off with the windows, but again, I'm still using my number eight round brush. And I've got a little bit of ultramarine blue with a tiny touch of burnt sienna into it with a very dark blue. Plenty of water into that. What I'm doing, where I drew the outline of the windows, just Now, a little bit more water into that same brush full of paint. So they're lighter. Oh, there. So it's the same brush full of paint with more water added. There. 
These are aquafine paints that I'm using. Strictly speaking, students quality paints. But as you can see, they've got a lovely, strong, rich colour. Strength of colour. Lovely paint. Traditionally, students quality paints are very weak and wishy-washy. But Dale Ramey, a couple of years ago, they reformulated their student quality range and put natural pigment into the aquafine paint. So it's got a real good strong depth of colour now. Lovely stuff. And it doesn't fade like your average student's quality paint does. I mean I also use artist quality paint, which can be quite expensive. They're not on my website, um, but they can start at about 20 quid in some of the shops for a 14 mil tube, 15 mil tube. Um, but the students' quality, I think they're about one pound eighty on my website for a tube. And I've got some here actually. No, I'll, I'll show you later. Um, but they're really strong paints, and they last for a long time as well. You know, you don't need a lot of paint to quite a bit of water. So very economical. But aquafine paints are very, very good. Now I've got a little bit of blue and burnt sienna again. I'm starting off with that first mass in the distance there. And I've changed my rigger brushes then. Number four rigger. Just fill that in. And a few little squiggly bits on the top there. Look. Like I said, nautical term. Same here. Going down. This is where red wine helps. Keeps the hand steady. <laughs> a little bit stronger. A little bit less water into it. So that one there. Riga brush is a really useful little brush. There. Now, I shall have a little bit of brown into that one, a bit of raw umber. Actually, I've got a mix on that left there, so raw umber and burnt in a mix. Put that in. Now, a few little bits here and there. And back to my blue and burnt sienna mix. A few bits. Some piece on top of that. I'm just doing lumps and bumps look. They aren't actually anything, but they look bulky. <laughs> back into the windows. I'm going to have a little bit of shadow on those. Ultramine blue, Lizaron crimson, burnt sienna. From within the window, I've just got a line on the top. And because I've got the light coming from the right here, down the right hand side. And that kind of like recesses the window into the cabin. With that shadow mix, I'm going to put a little bit more blue and burnt sienna into it. And I'm going to give the impression of planks on this one and that one. Don't start painting loads of indi individual planks. Look, it's just a few lines here and there. It's a little wooden boat. The same with this. I'm going to smooth these down again in a minute. Straight away across. Some bits there. Running out of paint. There. Just the impression of blank. Now, go back to that one. 
a big brush to soften those down a bit. Just with water that. I'll leave that for a second now. And actually, I'm going to come further forward onto the beach, get that on, let it dry, then I can put shadows everywhere. So again, a little bit of sand, Charles Evans sand. I've picked up some red there. And it's on the side of my bucket. Yeah, get rid of that. Bit of sand, like so. Carefully around my box. I mean, I could always go back in if I made a mess of it and paint bits again. But there's no need to do it if you don't have to. That's sand. Coming further forward there. I mean, the sand has got so many uses. It's good for beaches. <laughs> sand um, but also stonework really good for stonework all the various kinds of stonework it's good as a layering color put the sand on as I'm going to do here and then put other colors on top it's good as a lightener take your sand put it into every other color that you've got and it will lighten them without using white because I hate using Flesh tone, you know how flesh tone is really difficult to mix in watercolours? Sand, a little bit of light red, you've got flesh tone. Now, I've got a little bit of yellow oak here, plenty of water into that. A couple of strokes on that, here and there. Now, a little bit of light red. A little bit, look a bit like a stick of rock, there's a minute there. A bit of light red. Now, a touch of blue. Ultramarine blue, plenty of water. Wash out my brush, squeeze out, merge those colours together in big broad strokes. That gives you a lovely warm colour for your beach. The warmth, of course, comes from the light red. And in that little bit. Now that leaves it all dry, good and solidly. Because I'm going to have shadows going across the beach in a minute. So I'll leave that for a couple of minutes. Now, just before I start and put the big shadows on this, I've got just a couple of little bits and pieces more on the bolts and inside of the bolts. So I've got a little bit of raw umber and blue there. And there's my my oars resting inside the boat. That's my number eight round brush, by the way. And my Rolex <laughs> always makes me laugh. Little things. Now, I've got a little bit of blue with a touch of burnt sienna into it. I'm just going to pop a little bit inside. Got a boy there, so a little bit of light red. Just fill that one in there, like so. And on the end of it, a little bit of black, ultramarine blue, and burnt sienna mix. Another good way of making black is alizarin crimson and hooker's green. That'll give you a nice black as well. But it's not flat, flat and dead like a manufactured black. Now it's time for the big shadows. And it's again that shadow mix. Ultimately blue, because that's the blue of my sky. Bit of crimson, bit of burnt sienna. Bit more blue into that, it's better. There. Dark aubergine colour there, look. And all I'm going to 
going to do to start with is start off underneath the top of the boat houses, wheel houses. shadow always makes such a massive difference to any painting. And a bit there. And back there. And again here. You can see straight away that makes the top sit down onto the wheel onto the wheel. Now I've got a little bit in between that boat there. Wash out, smooth out, and soften that across there. Put a shadow on the front of the boat. Likewise, here, clean down, and around, all the way to the bottom, you see. And also on this one, to the front. One slope. Now curve that slope round like so. Again, wash out, squeeze out, soften that line there. Just with a clean damp brush. Where the white bit meets the boat, we'll have a lip. It's just a dark line of shadow underneath the top line. With a tiny point of my number eight round. I'm going to do the same with that one there. Again at the front, like I did on the others. Curve that slope roundly. I'm being fairly quiet really, aren't I? I'm concentrating. I can tell that because my tongue's come out. And a little bit more there underneath. And even that little one gets the same treatment. But again, once I put it on, clean damp brush, smooth that through. Bumpy bit at the bottom. Still with the shadow mix, same mix. You know this business about, because I've run out of shadow there, and you hear this thing all the time, always make sure you mix plenty, because you'll never be able to remix that mix again. What a load of rubbish. If you run out, mix some more. Now, what boat is casting shadow onto which boat? That one will cast shadow onto that one. Good strong shadow there, look. Onto the base. That one will cast shadow on that one. A diagonal stroke there, look. Those will cast a bit of shadow there. Now across the bottom of the boat, a bumpy bit. Another technical term for you, bumpy bit. Now this boat has a shadow. Those 
equals to because the shadow coming out here. Carefully around that little one. And the little one will cast a shadow as well. Again, the bumpy bit. Now, clean down brush, soften slightly. Look. There. Now I've got this big one in the foreground there, which is going to cast quite a big shadow in there. And can we both hold there? Always make sure you touch whatever's casting the shadow. Don't have your line there and the shadow here because that thing is not casting the shadow. When you touch it with the shadow, then it's casting a shadow. Does that make sense? It does to me. A bit more water. Now the boy. Even that will cast the shadow. And I think that I need a little bit more shadow down here. Yeah, I do. Like that better. Yeah. Just needed strengthening a little bit, that one. Now, I'll show you a little tip here, a little trick here. It's not strictly necessary for this one, to be honest, but I want to show you anyway. This is just a little trick, just to give a little bit more texture and, I don't know, a little bit more interest into the foreground beach rather than just being a flat bit. And it's especially useful when it's a big bit. So I've got a little bit of my shadow mix there. This is just an old toothbrush. Just mix that with that. Pick up a load of paint. Now, I'll just get rid of my palette for a second. I'm just going to put my hand across there. I'm just... Yeah. Now, put my finger. And just to finish this off now, with my ribbon brush, something to lead the eye into the picture. With a bit of black, opening blue and burnt sienna. And all I'm doing is having a rope from this boat here, down to the boy there. Then from the boat, from the boy itself, a rope, a bit of string, whatever, zigzagging out of the painting there. Another one there. There's just a few bits of rope here and there. Now, if I take my tape off there now and have a nice clean edge all the way around it, then we'll see a finished painting. And there we go, a finished painting. It's amazing the difference it makes once you take the tape off and have nice clean edges all the way around it. But there's no hidden tricks there. You've seen everything the way I do it. Um, as I said, the paints I'm using are these, Aquafine, Dale Rowney Aquafine tubes. Um, and these are five mil tubes. They're about pound eighty per tube which is really inexpensive for a good quality paint because as I say they have now got proper pigment in them as well. So plenty of staying power with this paint, good, strong, luscious colors. The paper I'm using 
is the Langton Roof. The pads come in various formats, that's a small one, and that's a really handy one to start off with. If you're starting off with a new paper, try it with a small pad because they're not expensive. This paper is only 140 pound weight, and I never ever pre-stretch paper. Tape it to the board, chop it in half, off you go. Um, and you can see there's no cockling and wrinkling and wobbly bits that stop you from painting. Um, and the other good thing about this stuff is both sides are the same. And both sides are sized, so there's no wrong side to paint on. It's really good, hard-wearing, hard-working paper. Lant and rough. The, bolt up, the, the, sorry, the book I've just been working from is ready to paint in 30 minutes, bolts and harbours. And it's a really good selling book, is this one. It's been sold in just about every language. But a really useful and easy to follow book. Another li good little book is that. So many people around the world, because again, in lots of languages, have got that book. It seems to be everyone's go-to book. And it's a book full of tips and techniques. It's just tips and techniques, loads of them. And little bits and pieces all the way through them. Various trees, lots of things in there. And all the colour mixes that I'm talking about, there you go, look, there's all loads of colour mixes. They're all in there. All those greens, just from Hooker's Green. And Charles Evans's pocket book for watercolour artists. A really handy little book. So have a look on the website, charlesevansart.com. Go on, have a look on the eShop, and you'll see all the stuff there. Hope you've enjoyed this one. Give it a go. And the next one will be an acrylic painting in a couple of days. Thank you.